Hi, Steve here, blessedhopeforever.com. Just a few comments before our uh, study uh, this morning. Of course, the church age has its shepherds. Uh, Feed my sheep, John 21, 17. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, 28. For I know that I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Acts 20, 29. Okay. And uh, as far as being rapture ready, uh, I'm addressing comments I've received here uh, in the past few days. If you are a child of God, you couldn't be more rapture ready. So now I'd like to uh, begin with our study here, continue on in Acts. Uh, we're doing a survey of Acts. We're at chapter 5, verse 12. I hope to make it into the seventh chapter. Uh, beginning at verse 12, the hands of the apostles. Uh, uh, at the hands of the apostles, there were many signs and wonders. Uh, we're looking at a period in which these gifts were temporary. Uh, they were wrought among the people. Uh, they were on Solomon's porch. We've, we've been looking at how the confrontation between John and Peter with the Sadducees and the chief priests and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we looked, uh, uh, this past several weeks, we, we've been looking at really just who is working here, operating here, the Holy Spirit, uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit, that is being controlled by the Holy Spirit. And we've seen who's been adding these souls to the body of Christ. And it's not man doing that. It's not the individual believer that pitches in, does his part to add to the church uh, the many souls that were saved. We're looking at God's people, His sheep. Uh, Peter and John uh, are feeding His sheep, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ that He had rose from the dead. And as I pointed out, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Now I want to get to something very interesting here that covers a period of history that where we uh, hopefully in this video you're going to see the breaking point or the which you might call the pivot point of where the church got it God is setting Israel aside uh, in unbelief and because for the sake of the Gentiles that salvation would come to the Gentiles we're looking at uh, a a real history here of how that God reached out to His people. He came unto His own. His own received Him not. Of course, He said that if another come in My name, him you will receive. The Messiah has been rejected at, at every single turn right up into to where we are at here. They continue to reject the truth concerning uh, their Messiah. And so... Uh, they laid their hands on the apostles. They put them uh, in the common prison. Uh, I suggested they didn't have a right uh, to, they had a right to do that, but they, they did not have a right to tell them what they could speak or not speak. An angel opens the prison doors. He brings them out of there. Uh, he tells them to go and stand and speak in the temple to the people, all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning. They taught. Uh, this is where they went to teach. But the high priest came in and uh, those that were with him, and they called all the council together, all the senate, uh, all the, the children of Israel that represented the children of Israel. Uh, they sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they didn't find them in prison. They didn't find him in prison because uh, an angel had, had cut him loose. Okay? Uh, an angel set them free. Now, I don't believe for one second that the apostles, they had a death wish, but look at what they were doing. They were confronting the religious leaders of their, t of their day with the truth of the Word of God. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, that is, they were controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's not that, well, that they, they weren't, they, their, their gas tank ran low and they needed to be filled up more with the Holy Spirit. 
uh, because there was something lacking. The filling of the Holy Spirit, it means controlled by the Holy Spirit. Controlled by. Now, how are we controlled by? Well, through the Word of God, through the truth of the Word of God. They spoke boldly. They spoke without fear. Uh, the power of being controlled by the Holy Spirit is immense. It can cause any fears to evaporate. Uh, they brought them out without balance, so they they didn't they feared the people lest that they you know they'd be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, uh, saying, uh, "Didn't we command you?" that you should not teach in this name, that name being Jesus. And, you know, look what you've done. You filled the whole, the whole city with your doctrine. You filled the whole town, the whole, all of Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. They did not have that, uh, the authority to issue such a command as to tell them not what not to speak. They, they had... They had a First Amendment right in Judea at that time under the government, governance of Rome. Okay, We ought to obey God rather than men. Uh, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, uh, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. They're not very tactful. They're being pointed and, and blunt about it all. But God exalted him to his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance, change of mind to Israel, and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, say John and Peter. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to them that hear Him, obey Him. The word obey doesn't mean to do, it means to hear. An intense form of the word hearing. And when they heard that, they were cut to the heart and they took counsel to slay Him. Cut to the heart. The word means to properly means to pierce all the way down. That is deeply, thoroughly pained, emotionally pierced through, psychologically, emotionally stunned. It's it's the word is only used here in Acts two thirty seven. Then a Pharisee stands up. Uh, his name is Gamaliel. He's a doctor of the law. He was very reputable among all the people. Uh, and uh, and, he, and he says to his contemporaries there, basically, uh, if I could sort of sum it up here, he said, look, you know, look, you men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do with these individuals. Be careful because there, there's risen up others in the past, uh, uh, Thutis is one. Uh, he had about 400 people that joined him. Uh, he was slain, and uh, they, as many as, as followed him or obeyed him or listened to him, they were scattered and, and brought to nothing. Okay? And after that, Judas of Galilee in the days of, of the taxing, he drew away a lot of people after him. He also perished, uh, even as many as obeyed him, and they were scattered. They were, they were dispersed. And so I, I'm, I'm telling you, refrain from these men and leave them alone, is what he said. Leave them alone. Because if this is a work of man, all right, it'll come to nothing. But if it be of God, there's no way that you're going to possibly overthrow it, throw that. So, you know, we don't want to be kicking against God here. We don't want to be fighting against God. And so they agreed with that, and when they called the apostles in, they beat them. They beat them, they commanded again that they shouldn't speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. This time they got a, a, a beating, whereas, yeah, as I pointed out, as we saw before, they didn't. Uh, what happened to leave them, leaving them alone? And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Christ. And so they continued. They continued. They didn't, they didn't listen to them as far as remaining quiet. How could they? 
So they, they continued to preach daily in the temple and in every house that they walked into, they, they didn't cease, the text says, to preach and, and, and teach Jesus Christ. Why? Because they were controlled by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to say spirit, even though our authorized version says ghost. I'm not a big fan of ghosts, so I'm going to, the word is pneuma in the Greek. Okay, so they multiplied. They're, they're, and then there arose this argument between the Grecians, the Hellenistic Jews, the, the Greek-speaking Jews against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in, uh, in being helped, basically. Okay, they, they thought that the Jews, Jewish widows had precedence. Uh, they, they didn't uh, feel like that was their duty and obligation to do that. They, their, their job was to continue studying and preaching the Word of God. So they pointed out seven men. They found seven honest men full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. And they appointed them to handle this matter uh, so that we can continually give ourselves to prayer, to the ministry of the Word, and that's that saying, them saying that pleased the whole multitude. And here comes Stephen into this. They choose Stephen. They chose Stephen. He was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And uh, they chose six others. Uh, the text will give you their names. Uh, uh, this is just a summary of this, not verse by verse. So, uh, there were six others, and they, they, they uh, prayed, they laid hands on them. Uh, the Word of God increased. The number of the disciples uh, multiplied in uh, Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. They heard the good news. They were God's sheep. They heard. And so uh, Stephen, full of faith and power, he did great mir miracles, great wonders among all the people. Uh, then there arose a, a certain uh, uh, group of, of those within the synagogue, which uh, were uh, of various different sects, different uh, sects, uh, that's S-E-C-T-S, -E sex, uh, cliques, if you will, uh, disputing with Stephen. And they were not in that dispute with Stephen able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. The reason they could not was simply because he spoke the truth of the Word of God. And they made up false claims. Well, he's blaspheming against Moses. He's blaspheming against God. God. This, these are blasphemous words of Stephen here. Uh, take note of that. Make a note, make, a, make a note of that. Just set that aside as I continue on here. They stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They stirred up a whole lot of trouble here. They came and they caught him. They brought him to the council. They set up false witnesses which said, you know, this man, he won't shut up. And he's speaking blasphemous words. That's twice in the text now we've seen it. The word blasphemous. Blasphemy. He's speaking blasphemy against this holy place. He's speaking blasphemy against the law. We've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is going to destroy this place. He'll change the customs which Moses delivered to us. Upset the cart, apple cart, upset everything. And, and all, all that, that sat in that council, uh, looking steadfastly at him, at Stephen, saw his face as, it, as if it had been the face of an angel. Now, in chapter 7, Stephen's martyrdom, a favorite subject of mine uh, because God named him after me. All right, I hope you laughed at that. Why did Jesus Christ stand in Acts 7, 55 and 56 when Stephen was being stoned? I hope to shed some light on that. I believe that there is a great significance as to why Stephen saw Jesus Christ standing at the Father's right hand in Acts chapter 7. Now, according to some of the marginal notes in your Bible, uh, some of the modern Bible versions, uh, standing may mean that Jesus is welcoming Stephen, verse 59. 
It, it's normally believed that, that Christ was standing up to receive Stephen, who was about to be martyred, who was Christianity's first martyr, by the way. This is a very big deal. I want you to keep in mind the love and the grace and the compassion of our Lord towards Stephen here. First martyr. Now, I don't share that opinion about welcoming. Uh, it's, it's of utmost importance that we study the context of the passage. We look at the, all of it as a whole and, and conclude something rational from that. Stephen, controlled by the Holy Spirit, stands before Israel's Sanhedrin, her ruling religious body in Jerusalem, having a glowing face that's reminiscent of Moses. Uh, he details Israel's long history of unbelief toward Jehovah. He's not very tactful here, but he's being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Their unbelief toward Jehovah, right up to her rejection and crucifixion of her Messiah, Jesus, at Calvary a year prior. Stephen says in verses 51 through 53, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So you're doing now. You know, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? They slain them. They slew them. Your betrayers, your murderers. You haven't kept the law yourself. These were great insults to the high priests, the chiefs, Pharisees, Sadducees, the Jews in general, ruling class. So when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him, the text says, on Stephen, with their teeth. Now, I don't think that's literal. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay? A verse I'm sure most of you are aware of. All references appear to be in the context of realizing what is being spoken is the truth. That's, that's, you gnash your teeth at that. But Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, looked up steadfastly into heaven. That, that denotes an intense focus on Christ, His person, His work, not on earth, not things on, the, on earth, which is where our focus ought to be. Okay? And he saw the glory of God, the worth of God, the value of God. And he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. There's a, there's big, there's a lot to, that could be said about right and left, folks. Or right, even in Scripture. He says, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and I see the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Standing on the right hand of God. Stephen claimed that he saw Jesus Christ standing on God the Father's right hand, which infuriated the unbelieving Jews because they knew the prophetic significance of that. Okay? Okay? Then they cried out with a loud voice and they stopped their ears. They ran upon him with one accord and they cast him out of the city, Jerusalem, and they stoned him. The witnesses, they laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, which we'll come to see as Paul. To say that, to say that the Jews were mad because they got so furious, so, so angry, because Jesus was standing to receive Stephen is, well, sort of, I'm sorry, it's just weak. It's a weak conclusion in my, in my opinion. It's reading the white spaces is what it is. The text is that they covered their ears once he said he, he saw Jesus Christ standing at God's right hand. They knew that Jesus standing was about affecting them, not Stephen. The Sanhedrin knew the Old Testament prophecies. They knew what Jesus' standing meant, the Messiah's standing meant. They knew that. And it was to them, this was not a good thing. Psalm 110, verse 1 says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, sit, okay, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. 
we read in Psalm 68, 1 and 2, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so drive them away. As wax melts before the fire, so let the wicked perish at the presence of God. And finally, in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 13, the Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. Okay, are we getting this now? And when the Apostle Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the death of Christ, the Holy Spirit said through him to the nation of Israel, For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Acts chapter 2. Peter, quoting Psalm 110, verse 1, interpreted it for us. Jesus Christ was now glorified in heaven, and He was coming back to earth to judge unbelieving Jews. They were not merely God's enemies, Psalm 110. One, but Peter said that they were now his foes, Acts 2.35. They had actively opposed and were still actively opposing God's purpose and plan for them by rejecting Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross and being ignorant of the message that the apostles were preaching to them in early Acts. Israel had had... Great number of chances, opportunities to, to obey God, but they didn't. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, uh, about the middle of the chapter, now when they, when they heard that, that they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter, to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter urged his convicted Jewish brethren, his brethren, those who would have ears to hear, to repent, that is, change their mind and be identified, every one of them, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Israel heard Stephen speak in Acts chapter 7, in which was a scathing rebuke of, of Israel and its leaders, leadership, about a year after the events of Acts chapter 2, they were very mindful of what Peter had preached on Pentecost, they knew that the divine wrath, they knew that the, the divine wrath of God that Peter was speaking of was now even closer. By the time of Acts chapter 7, Israel had exhausted God's grace as a nation. As a nation. The next event for Israel, according to prophecy, was God's wrath. Psalms 2, Joel 2, Acts 2. Israel had rejected God the Father who sent John the Baptist. She had rejected God the Son at Calvary. She had rejected God the Holy Spirit speaking through Israel's apostles. And now, Stephen. They were rejecting Stephen and his message. Israel's rejection is complete. One dispensation ending Another beginning, the church. Stephen affirmed that Jesus Christ was prepared to come back, preparing to come back. He's standing. He's preparing to come back to earth to pour out His wrath on unbelieving Israel and unleash His righteous fury on sinful mankind. And Israel's religious leaders, the text says, were convicted of this. But they proceeded to stone Stephen. Blasphemy was worthy of death. The strange irony of here is that the real blasphemers was not, they, it was not Stephen, but it was the religious leaders themselves. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which could not ever be forgiven. 
This is a dispensational time marker, in my opinion. God is setting Israel aside in unbelief. That's why we see the Apostle Paul about to come into the picture. In fact, he already has. He's, he was present at the stoning of Stephen. He condoned it. However, the difference is Paul is one of God's elect and therefore not subject to God's judgment. Neither are you if you're in Christ. And ultimately, the mob threw stones at him until he died. I want you to try, if you can, to possibly imagine being sharp, heavy projectiles thrown at you until you die, except man didn't kill Stephen. God put him to sleep, says the text. This says a lot about how being controlled by the Holy Spirit can furnish peace in martyrdom. Josiah received that peace just as God told him. He said, you'll, you'll, have, you'll, you'll have this peace. And then what happens? You find him in a war and he's shot through with an arrow and he dies. But the, God said he had peace. King Josiah, who foresaw the impending national catastrophe, concealed the ark and its contents, including Aaron's rod, the, the vial of, of, of manna and the anointing oil, you know, within a hidden chamber which had been built by King Solomon, you know, its whereabouts will remain unknown until the kingdom age when the prophet Elijah will reveal that. Stop looking, all right? You're not going to find it until the Lord returns. So Jesus is seen standing, not sitting. God's wrath on mankind was literally moments away, dearly beloved, but the greatest dispensational change to ever grace God's dealings with man occurred. Thank God Almighty that that wrath was postponed or we, we wouldn't be here I, and I wouldn't be doing this video. I'm, I'm jumping ahead here, but, uh, but Saul of Tarsus, leader of uh, Israel's uh, opposition to Christ and his little flock, uh, keeper of the clothes of Stephen's murderers in Acts chapter 7, he personally meets Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 9. We're, we're a little ways from there, maybe a, another week or so, we'll get there. Uh, you likely know the story. Saul was traveling to Damascus to persecute more uh, Messianic Jews, when the risen, ascended, and glorified Lord Jesus Christ appeared to, to him from heaven. Saul uh, experienced God's love. He experienced God's mercy and grace. He trusted Jesus Christ alone as his personal Savior. Why? Because he was set apart from his mother's womb. It wasn't some sudden decision that he made. He, he made the... He, he just, he went into what he was, became the first member of the church of the body of Christ. Jesus Christ commissioned him as the Apostle Paul to carry the message to the Gentiles. And after that conversion, Paul had another extreme ministry. Jesus Christ crucified for our sins, buried and resurrected. The same message Stephen preached. Years later, Paul would write uh, of himself in 1 Timothy, you know, where he says, uh, I was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. I harmed Christians. I killed them, even, in fact. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Same as Israel. Ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding of abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That is, I am first. Now listen. But for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first, first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. That's you and me. You and me. 
in order to have mercy on Christ rejecting Israel as well as on all of us unbelieving Gentiles, God had to suspend Israel's prophetic program to save Saul of Tarsus. God had to begin a new dispensation, a new set of instructions to mankind, a new program, one that he had in mind from before the creation of the world, but he kept it secret. We're talking about the mystery, the program, or the dispensation of the grace of God, the very age that you and I live in. It was a mystery in the Old Testament. We know that from Ephesians chapter 3. So God delays His wrath yet again. Today, Jesus Christ once more sits at the Father's right hand. For almost 2,000 years now, that wrath has been delayed. The day is coming, dearly beloved, when the church, the body of Christ, will be caught up into heaven. And the seven-year tribulation, the last seven years of, of Satan's reign on planet Earth will run its course. At the end of those seven years, Jesus Christ will stand, arise, from his seated position at the Father's right hand. He'll stand once again to fulfill all of the Old Testament and New Testament prophecies that describe his second advent, his return to earth in great power and, and great glory. Psalms chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says that he sitteth in the heavens. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Thank you, thank you, thank you for following this channel, for continuing to support this channel. Thank you for your prayers concerning the direction of this ministry. Thank you for the prayers, the recent prayers concerning my health. We pray for you constantly. We love you dearly. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word and for one another. We thank you for the feeling, the controlling of the Holy Spirit that we can walk in true relationship with you based upon the truth of your word. We thank you for your grace, your love, the many blessings, the all you've blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. In Christ Jesus, help us, Lord, to see and to understand that great love that you have for us, that there's no condemnation, that we stand before you righteous, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in your sight. Filter out any foolishness, any any error, we are so aware of our, our limitations. Seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Until next time, thanks for watching.